Hey everyone, thanks for coming along. We have a decent number of people who've showed up, so um, might as well get started. I'd like to begin this thinking space by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting. The Gadigal people would be your nation and um, send my respect to uh, elders past, present and emerging and the same for wherever people may be joining this meeting online. Um, today we've got uh, June Rubis here to speak to us. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for coming on. And I will hand it over to you. Oh, that's true. Um, I'm not sharing the screen, so I will fix that and then hand it over to you. Thank you, Jamie, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. This is actually my first, I was telling Bob and Jamie, my first talk in two years, I mean, in person. So I was a bit, I feel if I feel a bit overwhelmed, it's also seeing people in real time uh, and not just online. And I also want to thank people online for joining in. I just want to briefly introduce myself if you're not so familiar. I'm affiliated with the Department of Geosciences, um, but I'm also a postdoctoral fellow of the Sydney Environment Institute. Um, that's in the quadrangle. And uh, I was hired uh, to work on indigenous environmental studies. So the talk today, well, before I begin, I'll, I would also like to acknowledge country of the unceded lands of the Gadigal country of where we all currently reside. And I'd like to pay my deepest respects to the traditional owners, past, present, and emerging. So my talk today um, explains, let's see how that works. So my talk today um, explains how we can understand caring for the orangutan through the persistence of complex human and orangutan relations in spite of new colonial conservation enclosures, which seek to securitize orangutans as biodiversity and control humans as a threat there too. So I've been I've been thinking about orangutans for the past two decades. I'll talk about my a bit of my positionality in a bit. Um, but I've always been curious about how we work with the communities um, in the areas that we're interested in. So as we all know, if you work in, in conservation or with communities, they're no, by no means passive bystanders um, to these encounters with conservationists. And they all also have to contend with conservation related interventions on their lands. Um, so they selectively conceal and obscure important aspects of their lives in an effort to manage their relationships with the NGOs government agencies and other actors involved. So um, one of the questions I, I like to think about is what do these acts of concealment and evasion mean in relation to the larger struggles around conservation, dispossession around conservation interventions and environmental degradation. So this talk is partly based on an article I recently published in the Journal of Culture Cities um, through analysis of indigenous naming practices, knowledges, and and narratives I advocate for relating to orangutans, not as objects to protect, um, but instead as beings to coexist with. Uh, we understand this with indigenous methodologies and working with you know, different uh, indigenous communities around the world. And this I propose is what it takes to sustain wild orangutans as more than an abstracted species uh, with conservation value. I also wanna bring up another article I recently wrote for the so Social and Cultural Geography so as activists and scholars, we have been conditioned to think of institutional uh, visibility as a form of empowerment uh, for social and politically invisible populations, and therefore as a necessary part of accountable research. So from this perspective, um, one important way to challenge misguided conservation policies would be to document and make visible that which they misapprehend or dis distort. Um, but we, uh, Noah, uh, my collaborator and myself, we have come to question this notion as a result of our own respective research engagements. So Noah writes from his perspective, working with communities in Palawan, the Philippines, and I write about um, my, my work in Sarawak. So we ask, does the will to make invisible, even among critical scholars and activists, unconsciously reproduce the impulse uh, that drives the instrumentalization of documentation of traditional ecological knowledge, or the one that drives the discovery, the documentation, and secretization of new and threatened species. 
so the whole idea of the, the colonial idea of discovery and creating you know the idea of expertise so with these concerns in mind we have come together to interrogate assumption that documentation and institutional visibility are inevitable prerequisites uh, to protecting biodiversity or defending indigenous land rights and we wonder whether and how we can serve not just to document or render visible, but also to defend space for the survivance and resurgence of indigenous world-making practices. So in other words, how can we best work to challenge harmful uh, misconceptions while respecting protocols of concealment and evasion? Of course, we don't uh, seem to answer these questions in any definitive way, but we hope to inspire um, further critical reflection on the limits of visibility as a means of supporting indigenous survivance and of defending more than human assemblages from dispossessory forces, which includes conservation interventions. So I'd like to set the scene of where this research is premised. So for several decades, there have been large scale deforestation, encroachment on indigenous territories in Sarawak, uh, which is part of Malaysian Borneo. If you're familiar with Borneo, it's divided into three countries, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei. Um, that, so the idea of world poverty and being left behind of Tertingal has led to Sarawak's quest to accelerate um, development over the past uh, 40 years. So this has meant a vast transformation of Sweden land um, to intensive rural development of large scale cash crop plantations and modern infrastructure, um, including roads, electricity and piped water. So further uh, rural natives are uh, pressured, constantly pressured to participate in the market economy uh, through large scale com commercial plantation agriculture. So we, uh, the state aspirations to develop land for agriculture and other mega industries, um, which are often um, financed by China who are moving their polluting industries out of China into other countries in the global South. So this has led to conserve the remaining lands uh, for forestry and wildlife conservation purposes. So the development, I mean, the dream of development has become a nightmare for many rural native communities, producing labor exploitation and land tenure insecurity, including because of the creation of protected areas. So um, when we read conservation literature, um, you know, rural native peoples of Borneo are often written off as unruly, and they represent a constant threat uh, to nature and wildlife. And so therefore they have to be managed in different ways. So much of the wildlife conservation literature and practices, they rely on a Euro-Western uh, nomenclature that are legacies of empire. So although seemingly neutral, the practice of renaming nature depends on the political, philosophical, and social assumptions that encode top-down behavior and governance and conservation practices. So indigenous communities' processes of classifying nature are not recognized as valid, and as such, their conservation strategies are made invisible. So if indigenous knowledge is accounted for uh, by contemporary conservation, it is often from a paradigm that focuses on ecological and scientific knowledge rather than the complex interspecies relationships that indigenous communities have with nature. And as such, uh, communities are often perceived as a barrier or a problem towards conservation due to what is perceived as their lack of care uh, for species of conservation interests. So that about my position on reflexivity, I am from Sarawak, um, Malaysian Borneo. I'm from one of the native groups uh, in the Bidayu. I grew up in Sarawak. Um, so prior to joining academia, um, I worked as a conservation biologist uh, for the WCS, the Wildlife Conservation Society. And my dream, I don't know why, was to study wrong at times at that age, at young age in my twenties. So in 2000s, I, I spent that time um, surveying. Uh, we did, I did the first long-term orangutan um, survey in Batangai and Lanchak Entima, which are the last remaining habitats where orangutans, bald orangutans are found um, breeding in that area. So while working with WCS, I was just really curious on how we were working with communities because, and I'll talk ab about it um, later, because we're, we're their knowledge is often dismissed and they're often, we often use them and in, in relation also to myself as just field assistants. And I mean, it's also heartbreaking in a way because I, I did a lot of, we did, we did a lot of work myself and the communities were not necessarily recognized out of the research outputs that were produced out of the research I did. And at that time I was quite naive because it didn't matter to me to publish. And now I realized it does matter in a way of so how people perceive uh, so-called expertise. 
So from the Latin pongo, an anthropoid ape, and pygmaeus, uh, which means short or reduced stature, the Mayas, uh, which is what the Bonds called orangutans, are known as pongo pygmaeus in the scientific world, or more commonly as the orangutan. So for many of you who are familiar with the Indo-Malay region, which is I'm sure quite a few uh, here in Sydney, it is often assumed that orangutan is a term that locals used to know and name the great ape because it is after all derived from the Malay words, um, orang for person and utan or hutan for forest or person of the forest. However, as the Mayas is also found in regions where Iban people have lived and thrived for at least 400 years, the Ibans have their own term to identify and acknowledge the Mayas. So the non-indigenous origin of the term orangutan is little known outside the Mayas or Mawas um, habitats of Sumatra and Borneo. So in Sumatra, uh, the orangutan is known as Mawas, and also other parts in Borneo, it's known as Mawas instead of Mayas. So in Sarawak, the orangutan is known as a Mayas in many variants that depend on its characteristics. And in Sumatra and other parts of Borneo, the orangutan is known as the Mawas. So there's no literary record of the Malay speaking peoples using the term orangutan or one of its variants to refer to the ape before the middle of the 19th century. And the first recorded Malay use of a term resembling orangutan to describe the ape identifies the word as a Western term. The Hikayat Abdullah, a major literary work which was written in the 1840s by Abdullah bin Abdul Qadir, who is a Malaccan born Munsi of uh, Singapore, recounts that the ruler of Samba sent Mr. Raffles a present of the two apes of the kind of which the English called orangutan. So this is the 16th century of an orangutan, um, illustration of orangutan. So by the 17th and 18th centuries, orangutans that were presented to the Western audiences were creatures that were detached from their natural habitat, both literally and symbolically. So when we think about the Linnaean classification and comparative anatomy, it pays little attention uh, to where an animal came from as it did to its behavior. So the orangutan has loomed larger in the imagination of the West than it did in its native born in Sumatra. So in her seminal decolonizing methodologies book, Linda Tuey Smith describes how naming is part of colonizing methodology where renaming the land was probably as powerful ideologically as changing the land. So Smith thus offers countering decolonizing methodology to rename the world uh, using original indigenous names and to retain as much control over meanings as possible. So by naming the world, people name their realities. Uh, for communities, there are realities which can only be found in the indig indigenous language, the concepts which are self-evident in the indigenous language that can never be captured by another language. So setting the scene, so in the years 2015 and 16, uh, I conducted most of my PhD fieldwork um, in three Iban communities um, in Batangai. So I returned back in the National Park where they still remembered me as a conservationist. Um, so the, here the people continue to live uh, within the complex, the protected complex, and they have limited rights. Um, so since the gazetting of the complex, about seven communities in Batang Ai and 35 communities in Lubuk Antu, they have restricted uh, privileges uh, to hunt, fish, gather, jungle produce in the area for their own personal consumption and are not allowed to sell. So activities in the park are limited to farming of previously cultivated areas and gathering of forest goods. So in the return, the communities are said to benefit uh, from employment in the park and they have formed their own cooperatives um, that provide transport and accommodation and guiding for visitors. So the complex is also part of uh, the Malaysian Indonesian Transfrontier Protected Area since 1991. And so it shares a common border with Batuan Kerehun, which is a nature reserve in Indonesia. So together they form one of the largest transboundary protected areas in the wet tropics, uh, which comprises nearly 1 million hectares of hilly detrigal forests and are considered an important habitat for the Borneian orangutan, the Pongo pygmaeus pygmaeus. So specifically for that subspecies uh, Borneian orangutan. So nearly 30 Iban communities within and near the complex have been documented in existence uh, for over 400 years. And today the complex is considered ecologically important by the conservation community because it contains the only population of orangutans, the Pongo pygmaeus pygmaeus remaining in Sarawak. And prior to the gazetment of the complex, the Iban communities had fully exercised the native customary rights to the area without much interruption by the state. So that was before the complex was gazetted as a protected area for the orangutan. Uh, 
but during my previous field work in the complex in the mid 2000s, my team and I discovered four orangutan corpses that were shot to death in one year alone, which sparked a response by my um, employment at that time, um, a transnational conservation NGO, to focus on working with local communities through re-education programs of perceived lost cultural protocols that included the general taboo around hunting orangutans. So ever since it's been taken for granted by policymakers and conservation NGOs in the state that the fault remains on the local community level and as such conservation policies initiatives have followed this lead. So many communities previously living within or near the complex were displaced several decades ago uh, during the gazetting of the protected area after the dam was built. Um, and they lost most of their rights to access to the complex and were encouraged to participate in the government oil palm schemes in the nearby rural towns. So this represents a common theme throughout Sarawak and also many tropical countries. So I spent a lot of time questioning like how we had moved from a very, from just documenting orangutan while we're researching orangutan populations to then we educating them through um, this education programs. And I thought it was, I mean, we were all uh, Sarawak kids. So we, you know, we were local to the area, but not local to, to the, protected, uh, guess the, the protected area. And I felt it was, I didn't have the words or the terms or the theory to describe it then, because I, I did my, my first degree in biology. For some reason, I never did a social science degree when I, so social science class. So I never actually encountered the idea of political ecology until I decided to go back and, and do my, my master's and PhD. So, you know, and, and that's what it is. I mean, you were trained as a classic Western tradition where nature is in opposition with, you know, with the reason. So conservation is generally defined the orangutan within a discursively constructed divide that separates human and nature. So, you know, and this reveals a relationship of control and domination. Yet the Ibans have categorized and conserved the Mayas long before Western and Malaysian biologists had arrived in Batangai. So I learned this categorization of orangutan and Mayas early, early on in the days of my conservation fieldwork in the mid 2000s, but it had no place uh, in the research frameworks we were taught to use. So in my um, updated interviews uh, with conservationists, they emphasize their work on environmental education campaigns that they run uh, with the Batang Ai longhouse communities where primary school children were targeted. So these awareness campaigns include Western influence plays uh, with theater prop firearm and a long time mascot. And the main objective was to educate the rural Iban communities on the protected status of the Mayas and the landscape and to remind the Ibans of their stories of the Mayas and therefore their responsibility to protect the orangutans. Uh, so the central assumption that are garnered by the interviews is that the Ibans seem to have forgotten their ancestral stories, such as the prohibition to kill the Mayas. And the truth is, I mean, the ban was imposed by a different set of authority, uh, by which is conservation actors, and it's not a nuanced expression of Iban uh, adat or, or Iban uh, rules. So to the conservationists, the Mayas or the orangutans, they are the their utmost priority is to protect and the reason for their presence in Batangai. And the conservationists also mentioned a lack of income as a reason for hunting and explained that the sale of wildlife could be offset uh, by transforming would-be hunters into community patrollers. Uh, one conservationist uh, further explained their motives, indigenous conservation needs a carrot and a stick. Communities want development and when the right conditions exist, conservation could then be facilitated. For example, the enlightened ones uh, understand the negative impact of planting oil palm on their lands. So the rational order of conservation practice relies on the assumption that education campaigns would correct people's ways. Uh, humans are not seen as part of a healthy ecosystem and their actions need to be constantly monitored or managed. On the contrary, I argue that recentering indigenous practices and name of the Mayas enables um, practices of being with rather than managing off. And such practice places them the wrong time in different relations with. So there's a particular logic by conservationists to view the Ibans or other indigenous peoples that they work with as landowners who have lost their way or do not have sufficient knowledge uh, to manage natural resources in the present day uh, for the benefit of conservation. So to many conservationists, Ibans and other rural indigenous and local populations, they continue to threaten wildlife species with their practices and social life. And through the conservation logic of naming Iban people, land and more than human beings have become extracted from their relations and turned into resources or complaints. So the orangutan or the Mayas has been characterized 
uh, categorized as what needs to be protected, totally protected, and why they should be conserved. And if this further disembodies them from place and relations uh, with, with humans. So how do the Bants identify um, with the orangutan? Well, they've categorized or named orangutan long before Western explorers had arrived in Borneo. So I learned this categorization early on in my days of conservation fieldwork. And I also learned to dismiss local knowledge as not as important by, than the scientific data I was going to collect. And when I form my Iban interlocutors that I cited the Mayas, I always have to clarify what type of Mayas is it? Is it a Mayas Gesak? Is it a Mayas Rambai? So this method of classification pays attention to where the orangutan is most likely found and its appearance. And this helps the Ibans keep track of which Mayas is currently in what territories. So for example, the Mayas Kesak is an orangutan they often see in secondary habitats. And if you, if you talk about like the Mayas Rambai, the Mayas Gambi or other orangutans that's in, um, in secondary forests, they think, oh, it's, something's happening there. Why is this orangutan moving? So that's how they keep track of uh, where, they, where, where they're often found. So the, for the bands of Batang Ai, the Mayas have been part of the world through interrelations and interdependency for much longer. So according to Apa, who is one of my uh, main interlocutors, there are several stories that convey the interspecies relation, relationality of the Batang Ai bands and the Mayas. So one of the main stories uh, relates to how several years ago, the Iban women um, of his ancestors' communities were struggling to give birth safely. So they migrated in search of new lands to live on and were unfamiliar with the territories. So several Ibans uh, were on scouting expedition and they came across a pregnant orangutan eating a particular ginger plant. And they returned to the village with this new piece of information. They stocked the plant and prepared it for the women in the community who were pregnant. And this concoction of this uh, ginger tea had helped ease their birthing pains. And since then, the Ibans have credited the Mayas for this particular plant knowledge. So Indai uh, reminds me that up to now, the women in the community who have moved away from the longhouse into the city for marriage or work still request the ginger plant. We boil the plant and they drink it like tea. So this story and its variants have captured the conservationists and tourist guides attention. Although they sought to dismantle the story from its epistemological origins and try to reconfigure it into a moralistic fable. So we informed that because of this special connection with the Mayas, Ibans therefore have a moral obligation towards orangutan. Uh, particularly for conservation, this idea of moral obligation works in terms of regulating self-enforcement within communities. Because, hey, you're not paying anyone, right? You just remind them of the, the moralistic uh, obligations, and they will conserve uh, species for you. So, for instance, an education campaign that focuses on the law and consequences of killing the orangutan while simultaneously reminding the communities of their obligation to the orangutan, this assigns greater conservation responsibility and therefore consequences. So responsibility and consequences to the communities. So within this Euro-Western frameworks of conservation where humans are collectively homogenized, we don't no longer think of our relations uh, and colonial structures disregarded, the idea of more than human species of reliance uh, upon humans for survival persists. But for Apai and many of my other interlocutors that I work with, the Maya's birth story, along with the customary taboo against killing orangutans and other wildlife species, is part of a reciprocal customary adat. Um, adat, which is like a set of traditional rules that fixes interspecies connections to land and place. So they don't see it. There's no human divine authority over non-human species, nature and place. So the Mayas and the pythons and the other um, other more than human beings alike hold responsibilities, as do the Ibans, uh, while living on the same lands. So the orangutans, for example, are expected to uphold their obligation not to destroy the farmers' livelihoods, nor harm Ibans themselves. So we do not shoot to kill, but we shoot to scare the Mayas and other wildlife away from fruiting trees. And such, we can be begin to appreciate how the agency of the Mayas underpins Iban understanding of the universe. So the stories that are shared with me by Afai explains to me what he sees as the proper ways to be in the world and to maintain good relations and belonging, including with a more than human species. Of course, there's a danger, um, however, to disentangle stories from the place context and thus critiquing Iban's further for not fulfilling their end of the argument. So such a limited extracted engagement misses the potential to fully understand how a fuller interspecies relationship could exist and how it reinforces problematic relationships.
And of course, I do not intend to argue that these protocols are observed in constant harmony or to paint an idyllic relationship, um, a picture of interspecies relations. So my interlocutors often convey their own complex and urgent realities and balance. How do they balance these interests uh, with the expectations of conservation actors and other institutions that are interested in the land practices and social lives? So um, uh, Kim Talbear and Haraway, they talk about the context of relationships of care and to make kin. And perhaps it's within this context that the politics of naming uh, could be best understood. So by attending to these relations, we also attend to responsiveness to how we attend or care. And these ideas uh, from Bawaka country as well, beyond the imperial modes of constructed care. So I therefore argue it is necessary to consider how we approach ind indigenous naming, for example, knowledges and practices in conservation work and also in our citational practices. So it's these ideas of knowing the Mayas beyond to protect, but rather to connect in place that maintains orangutan human relations as more than an abstracted species with conservation value. In other words, we must know the Mayas beyond its mostly charismatic and conservation value and carefully think through its embodied correlations with place and events or other indigenous peoples living in the same lands. So just to summarize the main takeaways, mm, concealing protocols as an act of surveillance that we conservationists ourselves, uh, our researchers, we tend to understand one way to care for the orangutan. And it's decolonizing ways of know, knowing as to export existing indigenous governance and conservation that is happening already in place, um, despite um, more dominant conservation measures. And how do we relate to orangutans, not as objects to protect, but also as beings to coexist with. And I think that really much changes the di dynamics and also focusing on people who continue to live on the lands uh, with conservation species of interests. Thank you. So I'm gonna give you some time to think about it. I also have, um, maybe this is also for Bill, like what I've been currently working on, if anyone's interested since. <laughs> Um, oh, uh, these are some of the references you may be interested in as well. So some of, one of the questions which I find a bit awkward, so it's some is, uh, and it's often the students have the best questions because it's always the ones that needle, needle you the most, like what do you, so what do we do next in terms of decolonizing conservation? I mean, I, and I can't, I mean, I can't really answer that. I mean, my research is part of it, but I am also one person. So, but one of the work, um, that I find most clarifying is also non-academic work. Um, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Indigenous Global Communities Conserved Areas. It's a global consortium um, of Indigenous communities around the world on, on, yeah, on, on how communities conserve areas in their own way. I, since 2002 years, I've been a council co-chair of the theme Documenting Territories of Life, of which we work with um, various Indigenous uh, NGOs and communities around the world. That's my bio. Um, so part of the work I've been doing that I find also quite satisfying is like translating research into policy. So I've co-authored a Territories of Life report and Global Spatial Report Indigenous Territories around the world, how Indigenous communities around the world are conserving areas, uh, the native customary lands. And you can find it at report.territoriesoflife.org um, if you're interested. I also assisted the Indigenous Peoples Rights uh, International, which is an Indigenous NGO, on the conservation and criminalization of violations of Indigenous Peoples Rights. So these reports are important because they're taken to international symposiums. So like, for example, the IUCN that I also recently spoke at uh, last year, and also like the CBD, where you know, they, 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 they provide with evidence how Indigenous peoples and also local communities and around the world are conserving areas in their own way and how can we best support it? And one of the, 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 the takeaway, the main takeaways is financial, financialization. So like, how can we help finance? Uh, you know, how do we ensure, for example, the climate financing, which is so much that goes, it gets thrown into these countries, gets thrown into like global NGOs. How do we ensure that it actually goes to the communities who are doing possibly the most of the work? So it's, we, we also talk about, you know, financialization, how can we directly fund the fund, directly give the funds to the people who need it the most and who are already doing the work. Um, I am a co-chief investigator, uh, working with um, my collaborators um, in Newcastle and Macquarie. Um, we have been lucky to get a link, link, linkage grant 
on more than human agreement making with Empire countries. So that's um, up at um, Bellingen, the castle area. Um, so I've also, I am one of the co-founders of the Fresh Water Fish Features, which is an NG, indigenous NGO collective actually of scientists, scientists, artists and writers, environmentalists, sound geographers and journalists. So together with Ame Kassinger, you may be familiar with them. They're a sound geographer, an amazing sound geographer, but I just cut off. So we got a, it's a small grant uh, from the Canadian Social Science and Humanities Research Council Partnership Development Grant to study um, uh, yeah, resistance and extinction, global extinction and ecological resurgence uh, through listening to with the fish in Kumbaya country, the Pacific and Malaysia. Um, this is uh, actually, it's not so much my work, but it's um, my, my community's work. Uh, my, my sister also helped them get a grant. Uh, this is Bidayu, so I'm my, my dad, that's my dad, uh, one of the Bidayu communities and they have their own cooperation. So have been like how do they want to how do they recenter fish water fish with uh restoring uh restoration of the the rivers in Sarawak so they recently want a grant uh, for that from the GEF small grants to mobilize communities um to conserve the the river systems in our territory so that's my dad and if you're interested in hearing me talk I'll be talking uh this Saturday uh at the SCA gallery I don't know where that is so I'll be talking to Bidayu just like this for uh, um, artist Tian Baker, and they've created this work around the skull blessing. So, if you're familiar with Borneo, um, we have a headhunting history, and my father was one of the leaders who revived um, the skull blessing ceremony at Gawain Yombang. So, I'll be talking this Saturday uh, with Tian Baker. It is, it's actually a really interesting um, exhibition around artists with intersectional identities, um, yeah, and, and their and their work. So come for that. I hear there's going to be some tropical fruits if you're interested. And that's it. So thank you so much. So that's what I've been doing up to. But I'm happy to take on any any responses or questions or feelings or similar things that you've been working on. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Jane. Um, yeah. um, yeah, so does anyone um, have any questions in the room or on Zoom? I'm also happy to, oh, okay. Oh, hi, nice to see yeah. you again. Hey, guys. <laughs> um, I was just wondering about the degree of recognition that's customary in title of land. So you spoke about sort of the exclusion in the conservation area. So they only recognize land that has already um, cultivated you know, um, for like, for example, for gardens and such. So you don't recognize all customary lands. So for many indigenous communities in Borneo, they have different um, descriptors of land, like how do you preserve, you know, like how do you use the land in different ways? So they have, um, for example, like um, protected areas where they do conserve it. So that's where they don't, they don't cut down like the big trees they need to grow, they don't necessarily hunt there. And then there's areas of land, um, for example, where they they grow, the fruits and such. So like for, um, yeah, uh, consumption. So that's often what the government recognizes, as long as you can prove that you, that has been done before a certain period in 1960, which is a very, you know, sort of like the colonial era that has been done prior to that. So that's also, that's very difficult to prove. And that's, that's why there's at least, I mean, over 300 uh, court cases that are happening right now in Sarawak. And what's difficult as is, because when I when I talk to activists, it's quite interesting because they're also quite sympathetic towards companies. So companies who arrive on the lands and said we were given rights to cultivate this area for the oil palm because the government said it's state land, no one exists. And then you've got communities that say, no, that's my land, you know. So you have all these fights. So often actually some activists will have sympathy for the companies because there's so much confusion of what is land, where is state land. Um, for the Sarawak government, our land is state land, unless you can prove otherwise. Uh, and that has been very difficult uh, for many communities. Because you have to show, for example, so one way of markers to identify your land is cemeteries that people buried in an area, or like old durian trees. You can see my, my grandfather planted that durian tree, and you know, you've got oral history to back it up. So you also need to have, you have to have a lot of people um, 
in in your support group, like for example, the leaders, so you got like the, the, the leaders are recognized by the state, so they'll argue your case. But I think what's difficult now, and I was actually, I can't remember what talk I was in, it was quite similar. They were talking uh, from their experience in, in Fiji, I think, where, where families are also growing and the land has just gotten smaller and shrinking and shrinking. So what do you do when you've got land and you, you have to parcel out, you know, like so people are increasingly finding themselves with very much less land. And what I've seen in Bantana is that people are tilling the land over and over again. So you know how you're supposed to till the land and then you're supposed to let it rest too, so that it regenerates, soil regenerates, and you move to a different spot. People just don't have areas. So they're just reusing the land over and over again, which means like they have to pump in more fertilizers. They're often subsidized by the government. So then there's a lot of, um, you know, like pollution in terms of nitrogen, I suppose, uh, coming out from the soils. So it creates like this so many runoff effects. Um, I think when, I guess it's, it's interesting when I get to talk because I have so many different reactions. A lot of people sort of want an answer, like what happens next. I think, I mean, the simplest answer is to just respect, you know, respect the communities who continue to live in this lands, have their own ways to manage and deal. And they're not necessarily naive. They may appear naive when you talk to them, that they don't know what's going on, you know, but they have a way of like, to sustain, you know, the, their presence and, and traditions on the land. And one of the ways to do that is to never leave the land because once you leave the land, it's gone. So there's always, that's why you have um, in rural communities, I'm sure in, in areas that you work in, it's usually like the older people or like grandchildren that the, 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 grand, you know, the elders are taking care of. Anyone who's able to work, you're not living in the cities and such, but you need a presence, you need your community there to keep, keep an eye on the lands for you. Is, is the legal recognition of that important in the Sarawak context, or is it just more asserting an, an indigenous notion of ownership? I think it's important in the sense that how we understand native rights and it's 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 the court cases. So that's where like the most you know that's where it gets the most press attention, um, and that's where things can happen. Where we're also so there've been cases where the federal um, courts would agree with like indigenous um, well, with communities uh, in terms of you know respecting their lands, but then the state would then, you know, so the fact that it's happening in the courts actually really matters and it helps sort of cement um, the ongoing work that goes on with for, for activists and NGOs working on land rights. So I think it is quite important to bring it up, but then it's also exhausting. It also means like having full of lawyers who work pro bono and you do have that, but often then they get pulled in into politics because you know it's, it's, it's a bit of a mess. So everyone's sort of stretched out trying to do their thing. Um, yeah, but I, I, I think it's important because uh, I think administratively people sort of look up the government as, as in like the, the right set of authority. Everywhere it seems. Yes, yes. Thank you, Kai. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, June. It was fun to have to talk. Um, this relates actually similarly to Jeff's point. I wanted to ask you about the population pressures. You identified, identified I think, about 30 groups. Um, two communities. Two communities. I mean, yeah, 30, yeah, communities living in the area. Yeah. yeah. Um, how, how has that evolved in the time that you've been working there? Because population pressure does, as you've just described, the ability to transfer land to yeah. your children um, is limited in a particular area context. What sort of population pressures are emerging at the moment? Actually, um, so one of the things, I would say rural population is going down yeah. because people are being forced to move out. I mean, especially if you're a certain age and population and, you know, like it's generation wise, you want something different from your, your parents. So people do move out. So they're actually facing, it's, it's quite interesting that they, they're, they're looking for families to come back. And so they're like to regenerate the villages as well. Uh, they would only come back, for example, through Gawai, through holidays, um, when they're able to come back. Um, I think what's also interesting, and maybe not, it's just really hard to talk about as well, is that, well, they also accept um, newcomers, so people who marry in, and often they come from the Indonesian side. So that also is very much sort of like on download because then they have to come without citizenship, but then they get merged. But I think, I mean, they are all Ibans, they are all from the same community, it's just that it's got like the, um, yeah, the nation state. That cuts up the boundaries of the communities. Uh, in terms of property, yeah. So, uh, what what I also found interesting um, working in the communities is that they often say the people who have moved out have become poor 
So, for example, my maintenance welfare are up by an Indi they send money to their adult children who are currently working in the city because it's so hard. I mean, like it's expensive to live in the city, especially if you're working lower wages. Um, suddenly you need money for like a car because like public transportation is poor. You have to get to work on time, petrol and food and electricity, which you never really needed. In the rural communities, actually it's pretty set up because the government does take care of the rural communities quite well. You got Medicare, they, they would come to these areas. Uh, you provided um, with, um, what do you call it? Uh, <laughs> so electricity that comes from wind, yeah, solar panels and such. So there's actually a lot of interest in the government. It's, it's quite interesting because I find this a push in tug where the, the government wants rural communities to move out, but at the same time, they're very supportive because that's a border base. <laughs> In, in a lot of ways. So the, there's a lot of politics that we handle uh, in these areas. I think part of my work, I mean, it, it's so nice to talk to as well uh, people in Australia. I often get to talk in, in the UK and the US. I haven't as much, I've given one big keynote speech in preaching. It's just harder, I think, to talk to other Malaysians and Sarawak kids because they're looking at me going like that. So that, which is why I always put up my positionality going, I, I'm not a naive researcher doing this for a PhD. I actually live that life. And, and try to convince it that way. And I found it, it didn't work and it didn't satisfy me. I had so many questions and therefore I did up, went up and did my PhD. So yeah, that was my quite a journey that I try to move in as well. Sorry. I, I think that last point is really interesting about how you um, met with you know, your background and so on. But how, how do you uh, find working with other Biologists internationally, particularly primatologists, because I had this. I've, I've had this at, where I worked a little bit with IUCN, and whenever there were community-based wildlife management, there were really enthusiastic people in IUCN, yeah. and then there was a whole hardcore of people who were who thought it was complete nonsense, and, and IUCN was selling out of conservation and so on. And I, I, I have heard that primatologists are the worst. The, the most reactive against this sort of thing. I don't know if that's true. I think so. I think there are few ways. I mean, this where they come from, even, you know, they may be country in country researchers, just like the sense of patronage, you know, patronage towards rural communities. And when I think about, sorry, this hand up? No, no. So when I think about how I grew up, so I was born and raised in Kuching, I mean, we, we saw like the progression of my, my dad came from the village, the progression of rural village to city. You know, then, you know, working here, for example, that is like the progress of development. You know, that's like the art that you should be aiming for. So to return to that and say, you know, we should, you know, we should go back and listen to our relatives and communities, it really shapes people up. Yeah, primatologists are often, the, I mean, they're very polite. They'll be very polite to my face. And I think they also respect that I did the work. So my name is, if you've done um, a long time work, you're familiar with my name because they know that I did the field work then. So there is some respect that I, I think they may not necessarily agree with the conclusions I've come up with, and that's fine. I think I, I think also just creating a space. When I did that keynote speech for the tropical the tropical ecology conference, um, the social scientists were very excited. <laughs> social scientists were very excited, or anyone working in communities are really excited for me to stand up and, and, and say these things. But yeah, biologists. And I understand that because actually when I think about it, doing a long time biology field work was the easiest field work I did. It was just physically like hard for us, but it was like the best work because everything is like in a box and you just fill in all the numbers. It's very easy. You don't have to think about community politics. You do in some way in relation to how you work and how to get your um, field workers in mind, et cetera, but you don't have to think about the policies and such. And that's, it's so nice. I actually, I sort of miss that sort of work. It made life easier. When you're doing this kind of work, you, you, you interrogate everything, you interrogate yourself. You think, am I also doing more harm in some ways, you know, sort of talking about this. Um, I think it's also a matter of finding your own space. I think, and I think, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of receptions, especially in places like Australia, who, you know, um, who just researches with the Aboriginal communities. There's a lot of acceptance for, you know, perspectives like this and why this matters. I think having this for like in Southeast Asian perspective, I think it's a bit harder to shift because people still come with a very mindset of like rural to urban mindset, um, which is why I always emphasize in my talks of where I come from previously. Um, yeah. I hope that was helpful for everyone.
Thank you also. I mean, I've really enjoyed an in-person talk. It's actually a lot nicer than things mm -hmm. like Phil and Bob. They're like, no, we do it on in person. I was like, oh no, but I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, anyone else uh, who have any questions right now? Go on Zoom. I realized I moved away from the camera. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. But... <laughs> no, I'm just afraid. Um, and the speaker. And the speaker. Sorry, and they're still there. Yeah, it's all good. Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, so if there are no more questions, might um, wrap up earlier. Um, yeah, thanks again, June. Thank you.